Hey, it's 4.55 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, July 13, uh, supposedly in the year of 2017. Before I get started continuing with uh, Michael Hoffman II's book, They Were White and They Were Slaves, uh, I want to re-impress uh, what I have said so far concerning all the atrocities we've seen against white people and there are crimes committed against all people by all manner of men and as I have said before these things would not be possible were a nation to keep the laws of Yahweh for instance he does not allow unending slavery and he does not allow a man to kidnap another man and enslave him. The sentence for anyone who does that is death. The only reason to have a servant is if they owe a debt and choose to uh, work that off, and that is indentured servitude, and you can only work that person six years. He established his laws and gave them to Israel to protect individuals' rights. Individuals' rights from the wealthy, from the powerful, from one another. And it's just a shame that so many in Christianity today they're so confused about the law and grace and the dynamics of the two. They can't even quote the law when they're trying to illustrate something that is ridiculously immoral. And I'm going to give you an example. This is an article from Charisma News and the title says hot new fashion trend has men dressing in skirts dresses and eight inch heels now if you see these pictures here of these men in these dresses that's an abomination now what this author, <clears throat> I guess uh, Michael Snyder, what this author is unable to do as much as he is expressing his dislike, his disdain, he laments all of the television we watch and the effect that it's having on our minds. But what he cannot do, because he's confused about the dynamics of the law and grace. The law for a nation, grace, personal salvation for a individual. He's confused. And because of this, he can't just quite simply say that this thing is an abomination, as per Deuteronomy 22.5. A woman shall not wear men's clothing, neither shall a man put on women's clothing. For whoever does these things is an abomination to Yahweh your God. And you know, back in Exodus, when Yahweh is giving his statutes, <clears throat> he says concerning these things that he's telling Israel to do, he gives promises that should we do them, this is what will happen to a nation that does them, to Israel. If Israel does them, and these are his promises, 
so you know that they are absolutely concrete, okay? He says, concerning all these things, he says uh, in Exodus 23, uh, 23, 25, You shall serve Yahweh your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. No one will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. So there's nothing but goodness for a nation to keep Yahweh's laws. That's what they're for. So that we may live well before him. And if his laws were being practiced by England and America at the times when these things that Michael Hoffman has recorded were happening, the laws would not allow for these things to happen. But the enemy has crept in unawares and has bought off many powerful and influential people and has taught everybody such great lies that people don't know the truth anymore. I find it in a way amazing uh, how many people have such a quick knee-jerk reaction to the fact that I'm trying to expose to you the widespread brutality against whites in history in the light of the fact that these powers that control these nations and even the world are trying to convince everybody that somehow us common white people are the root of all of the problems of the other races and they're having so much success people left and right they won't even think they don't even stop to think maybe they haven't gotten the right story even people who know that they've been lied to over and again still pull this knee-jerk reaction like as if it could never be. It could never be that the white people of the world have been the targets of violence and aggression and lies for centuries, at least. Couldn't be. Couldn't be. Well, Michael Hoffman says that not only could it be, it has been, and he has documented it very well, so the question is, are you going to hear? Are you going to weigh these things? If it is so opposed to your current designed worldview, is that going to give you pause for thought? And are you going to rethink things? Or are you going to just mindlessly maintain your current trajectory? and continue the foolish, barbaric idiocy, which is the targeting and hatred of white people, all because of lies. The choice is yours. So, continuing on, Breaking the Chains of Illusion. Historian Oscar Handlin writes that in colonial America, white servants could be bartered for a profit sold to the highest bidder for the unpaid debts of their masters. 
and otherwise transferred like movable goods or chattels. In every civic, social, and legal attribute, these victims of the turbulent displacements of the 16th and 17th centuries were set apart. Despised by every other order, without apparent means of rising to a more favored place, these men and their children and their children's children seemed mired in a hard, degraded life. The condition of the first Negroes in the continental English colonies must be viewed with the perspective of these conceptions and realities of white servitude. From Origins of the Southern Labor System, William and Mary, Quarterly, April 1950, page 202. The history of enslavement in America as portrayed in the tunnel vision of the corporate media has focused exclusively on the enslavement of Negroes. The impression is given that only whites bear responsibility for enslaving Negroes and only Negroes were slaves. In fact, Negroes in Africa, as well as American Indian tribes, such as the Cherokee, engaged in extensive enslavement of Negroes. The Cherokee Indians owned large plantations on which they worked their Negro slaves in gangs. From R. Halliburton, Jr., Red Over Black, Black Slavery, among the Cherokee Indians, page 20. White slaves were actually owned by Negroes and Indians in the South to such an extent that the Virginia Assembly passed the following law in 1670. It is enacted that no Negro or Indian, though baptized and enjoyed in their own freedom, shall be capable of any such purchase of Christians. Statutes of the Virginia Assembly, Volume 2, pages 280 and 81. Negroes also owned other Negroes in America. The Charleston County Probate Court Records, 1754 through 58, page 406. While whites languished in chains, blacks were free men in Virginia throughout the 17th century. Willie Lee Rose, A Documentary History of Slavery in North America, page 15. John Henderson Russell, Free Negro in Virginia, 1619 through 1865, page 23, and Bruce Levine et al. Who Built America, volume 1, page 52. By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. In 1717, it was proposed that a qualification for election to the South Carolina Assembly was to be, quote, the ownership of one white man. From the journals of Commons House of Assembly of the Province of South Carolina, 1690 through 2 through 1775, volume 5, page 294 and 295. Negroes voted in the Carolina counties of Berkeley and Craven, in 1706, quote, and their votes were taken. From Levine, page 63, blacks were toting guns or other weapons and going about armed in the service of wealthy landowners at the same time that tens of thousands of enslaved white men were forbidden arms. In 1678, 1,000 Negroes were armed by the planters and formed into a fighting militia for protection against the French. Carl and Roberta Breidenbaugh, No Peace Beyond the Line, the English in the Caribbean, 1624 through 1690, pages 359 and 360. In Carolina, in 1704, 1707, 1712, 1738, and 1741, bills were Past, authorizing armed Negro militias in the service of the planters. In 1742, certificates were presented to the black militiamen for services rendered. In 
Warren B. Smith, White Servitude in Colonial South Carolina, page 98. During the American Revolution, Lord Dunmore, the royal governor of Virginia, appointed by the king, sought to win Virginia back for the British crown with black troops recruited in America, to be called the Ethiopian Regiment. Parties of blacks in the South were armed by the British with guns, clubs, and swords with the order to use them against rebellious American patriots. From Ronald Hoffman, the disaffected in the Revolutionary South, the American Revolution, Explorations in the History of American Radicalism, pages 281 and 282. By the 1st of December, 1775, nearly 300 blacks in uniform, with the words, Liberty to Slaves, inscribed across their breasts, were members of Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian Regiment. On the 9th of December, at the Battle of Great Bridge, the Lexington of the South, the bridge force of 600, nearly half black, was thrown back by Woodford's all-white American 2nd Virginia Regiment. In April 1782, General Nathaniel Green informed Washington that the British had armed and put into uniform at least 700 blacks. The Ethiopian Regiment was not the only black unit. That same spring, Two members of a black British cavalry, cavalry troop, about a hundred strong, were killed in a skirmish with Patriots at Dorchester, Virginia. Evacuating Boston, the Royal Army sailed to Halifax with a company of Negroes. It is possible that tens of thousands of black slaves in South Carolina and Georgia went over to the British. From Sidney Kaplan, the black presence in the era of the American Revolution, 1770 through 1800, pages 32, 61, and 67. During the War of 1812, the British ranks included approximately 300 armed American Negroes, who were used in combat against American forces. Some of these Negroes helped the British burn the White House in 1814. <clears throat> From Rodiger, page 44, no wonder that Frederick Douglass would declare to a white audience on Independence Day, nine years before the Civil War, quote, This 4th of July is yours, not mine. The British aristocracy's penchant for arming Negroes and Indians for combat against white Americans has largely been forgotten today. Even though it was one of these factors which led the colonists to go to war against King George, and was cited as such in the Declaration of Independence. The Patriots' outrage at Indian atrocities and anger at Dunmore's manumission of Negroes was summarized by Jefferson in one of the least quoted passages of the Declaration. Here we go, quote, he, meaning King George, has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, in parentheses, Dunmore's proclamation freeing blacks in American jurisdiction, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Now, before I go on to the uh, next chapter, Poor Whites in the Southern Confederacy, uh, let me point out first off, for those of you who have been, if you've been raised in any uh, white country, you have been taught that, of course, the whites in general came to America and just plain slaughtered these poor, nature-loving Indian folk and just treated them so, so terribly. And of course, they don't know the first thing about the 
demon gods of these Indians, the absolute brutality of these Indians, the torture of people by these Indians as pain offerings to their gods, for one thing. And of course, it's all through propaganda. When you got movies like uh, Last of the Mohicans, of course, which portrays so many Indians as absolutely noble, misunderstood people. Furthermore, I would like this message to go directly to any black person that may be listening to this, or white person who still just cannot cope with the fact that they've been lied to about our history and <clears throat> slavery and who's who and what's what. Today, today, blacks and Mexicans are being used in the same way they were then by King George against common white people who have done nothing to anyone but tried to raise our families, work hard, and obey laws. Is that description accurate about every white person, either today or in the past? It's not. There are many whites that are deviants, criminals, murderers, torturers, rapists, child molesters. Yes, there is. And they need to be punished for the crimes they commit. That's what God's law is for, to get rid of such filth, such vile people. So, I'm not saying that whites as a race or European Caucasians as a people are in some way above any other people. What I'm trying to do is set the record straight and show you that in the past, in colonial America, blacks were used by foreign interests like King George, who had outstanding debts to international bankers, and thus employed great legions of whites as slaves, absolute chattel slaves, and in fact used what Negroes he could against such common, hard-working whites. And now, poor whites and the Southern Confederacy. Even if they attained their freedom, dirt poor whites were forced to compete against Negro slave labor. Jobs were few, and Southern planters sat idly as poor whites died of malnutrition for want of food and medicine. Negro slaves were expensive. To protect their investments, white aristocrats usually treated their negro slaves well, providing for adequate food, clothing, and medication, even as poor whites in the same town sickened and died from disease and malnutrition. Try to envision the 19th century scene. Ye yeoman southern whites, sick and destitute, watching their children dying while enduring the spectacle of Negroes from the jungles of Africa, healthy and well-fed, thanks to the ministrations of their fabulously wealthy white owners, who cared little or nothing for the local white trash. And I'm going to interject here and say that uh, there's pretty darn good amount of information available 
that points to the slave trade, the black slave trade, the white slave trade. Let's just say the Atlantic slave trade as being an entirely Jewish dominated slave trade. So when this author mentions white aristocrats that owned black slaves or white slaves, we must be quite careful in drawing a distinct line between the common European whites and the money-loving Jewry that has dominated Europe and the Americas for many, many centuries. Just keep that in mind. In the course of an 1855 journey up the Alabama River to the steamboat fashion Frederick Law Olmsted, the landscape architect who designed New York Central Park observed bales of cotton being thrown from a considerable height into a cargo ship's hold. The men tossing the bales somewhat recklessly into the hold were Negroes. The men in the hold were Irish. Olmsted inquired about the about this to a mate on the ship. <clears throat> oh, said the mate, the niggers are worth too much to be risked here. If the paddies are knocked overboard or get their backs broke, nobody loses anything. That's from Frederick Law Olmsted, A Journey to the Seaboard Slave States, pages 100 and 101. GEM de State Croix Slavery and Other Forms of Unfree Labor, page 27. In the antebellum South, gangs of Irish immigrants worked ditching and draining plantations, building levees and sometimes clearing land because of the danger to valuable Negro slave property. George Templeton Strong, a Whig patrician diarist, considered Irish workmen at his home to have had prehensile paws rather than hands. He denounced the Celtic beast. Irish youths were sometimes called Irish slaves and more frequently bound boys. A common joke in the South in the pre-Civil War period was that when blacks were ordered to work hard, they complained that their masters were treating them, quote, like Irishmen. That's from Rodiger, page 133, 146, and 150. When I was a boy, recalled Waters McIntosh, who had been a slave in Sumter, South Carolina, we used to sing, rather be a nigger than a poor white man. Even in slavery, we used to sing that. Mr. McIntosh remarks reveal that the poor whites of the South ranked below blacks in social standing. Slaves felt unbridled contempt for lower class whites. Frederick Douglass opened his famous Life and Times with an account of Talbot County, Maryland, which he said housed a white population of the lowest order. Throughout the South, the slaves of many of the larger planters lived in a society of blacks and well-to-do whites and were encouraged to view even respectable laboring whites with disdain. Ella Kelly, who had been a slave in South Carolina, you know, boss, these days there is three kind of people. Lowest down is a layer of white folks. Then in the middle is a layer of colored folks. And on top is the cream, a layer of good white folks. The slave noticed their master's sense of superiority towards marginal farmers as well as towards poor whites and by associating themselves with de quality white folks, strengthened their self-esteem. <laughs>
A slave expressed no surprise that his master, who was Big Bukra, never associated with white trash, and Rosa Stark, who had been owned by a big planter in South Carolina, reported that poor whites had had to use the kitchen door when they went up to the big house. Her mistress had a grand manner, no patience with poor white folks. The many Negro ex-slaves who recalled the lot of the small farmers and poor whites as hard and even as bad as their own knew what they were talking about. The slave saw enough abject poverty, disease, and demoralization among the poor whites to see their own condition under Ole Massa's protection as perhaps not the worst of evils. From Eugene D. Genovese, rather be a nigger than a poor white man, slave perceptions of southern ye yeomen and poor whites, in Toward a New View of America, page 79, 81 and 82, 84, 90 and 91. This situation engendered a rage in the descendants and survivors of white slavery, which has seldom been accounted for in the history of white working class support for the northern abolitionist cause. We can gauge the attitude of yeoman whites, especially in the border states like Kentucky and Tennessee, but throughout the USA as well, who were either neutral during the Confederacy struggle or sided with Lincoln. From the statement of an Iowa congressman who maintained that it was the planter aristocracy, quote, which exalts and spreads Africans at the expense of the white race, unquote. And that's from Emma Lou Thornbro, The Race Issue in Indiana Politics During the Civil War, Indiana Magazine of History, June 1951. Some of the leaders of the Free Soil Party and many of the Unionist soldiers who made up the ranks of Lincoln's armies in southern Ohio, western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, southern Illinois, Kentucky, and elsewhere were survivors of white slavery or descendants of white slaves. They did not view themselves as advocates of what was then referred to as racial amalgamation. <clears throat> Historically, they regarded themselves as separatists and viewed the southern planters' desire to spread Negroes into California, Oregon, and other territories as a grave threat to free white labor and the Old Testament principle of racial separation, as per Nehemiah 13, 23-27, Ezra 10, 10-14, and Hosea 5, 7. Congressman David Wilmot sponsored a law to ban black slavery in the American West. He dubbed his proposed law, quote, the white man's proviso. He was bitterly opposed by the southern elite. Wilmot told Congress that he intended to preserve America's western frontier for, quote, the sons of toil, my own race and color. Charles B. Going, David Wilmot, Free Soldier, page 174. During much of the Civil War, the political and military leaders of the Confederacy could not travel in certain parts of the Deep South without armed escorts, from Jeffrey Rogers, Hummel, The Civil War, The United States at War Audio Classic Series, Part 2, for fear of attack from up-country Southern whites who hated the planter aristocracy and the war they saw as being for the sole benefit of the expansion of the planter's, quote, infernal Negroes, unquote. Upcountry Southern whites consisted in large part of the survivors and the children of the survivors of white slavery who resided in the hills, mountains, and Piedmont regions of the South under frontier conditions. In the antebellum 19th century South, <clears throat> a large number of white Southerners lived in the upcountry, an area of small farmers and herdsmen engaged largely in mixed and subsidence subsistence agriculture. Little currency circulated, barter was common, and upcountry families dressed in 
homespun cloth, the product of spinning wheel and the hand loom. This economic order gave rise to a distinctive subculture that celebrated, mutually, egalitarianism for whites and independence. Mountain counties rejected secession from the outset. One citizen of Winston County uh, in the northern Alabama Hill Country believed Yeoman had no business fighting for a planter-dominated aristocracy. All they want is to get you, to fight for their infernal Negroes, and after you do their fighting, you may kiss their hind parts for all they care. That's Eric Foner, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 through 1877, pages 11 and 13. Poor whites had to be drafted into the Confederate Army. As in the North, where resistance to conscription was widespread, many Southern whites saw the conflict as, quote, a rich man's war and a poor man's fight, unquote. Indeed, any slaveholder owning 20 or more black slaves was exempt from military combat. <laughs> from 1609 until the early 1800s, between one-half and two-thirds of all the white colonists who came to the New World came as slaves. Of the passengers on the Mayflower, twelve were white slaves. From John Van Der Zee, bound over, page 93, white slaves cleared the forests, drained the swamps, built the roads. They worked and died in greater numbers than anyone else. Both psychologically and materially, whites in modern times are called upon to bear burdens of guilt and monetary reparation for Negro slavery. This position is based entirely on enforced ignorance and the deliberate suppression of the record of white slavery in North America. Hundreds of thousands of whites had been enslaved during the colonial era in America, while millions of others were too poor to afford even a mule, much less <laughs> a black slave. Slave reparations and guilty feelings are due if one subscribes to such a thing as retroactive collective guilt from the descendants of the minority of wealthy whites who owned Negro slaves and who, in the South at least, were themselves generally reduced to penury in the aftermath of the Civil War. Reparations would also have to be paid by the descendants of the Cherokee and other American Indian tribes who owned black slaves by the heirs of black tribal leaders in Africa who sold them into slavery. Reparations must also be paid if the logic of the situation is to be consistent to the modern-day white descendants of the white slaves of early America. The whole discussion of Negro slavery, Southern racism, and the Civil War as currently framed by the establishment agenda necessarily must exclude any examination of the fact of white slavery, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries, and the condition of free white poor in the 19th century forced to compete against Negro slave labor in the South. Now, in retrospect and clarification about my remarks in that last chapter, do I think that the aristocracy of whites who owned these other white slaves and Negro slaves were in some way <clears throat> all Jews. I hate even using the word Jews because it makes one think of the tribe of Judah, which nothing could be further from the truth. But anyways, do I think all of those people who were the aristocracy who owned these great plantations, who profited so greatly off the misery of others, 
white and black. Do I think they were all Jews? I don't. Um, you know, many of them were probably Englishmen, possibly Scots, um, Romans, um, and various other uh, cultural nationalities of white. Again, I want to impress that I am not trying to even intimate that there are no evil people among the white race. <laughs> I mean, that would be absurd. But in general, I think that we're going to find, as we look closer at history, real history, factual history, we're going to oftentimes find the those who call themselves Jews, but are not, behind uh, many of the atrocities to the poor, common, white European. That's basically what I'm saying. And yes, there were many a white European, probably with uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, descent, Germanic descent, that willingly exploited their people. And that's what the law of Yahweh is for. If we would keep that, and we would enforce that, those things would not be allowed to happen. Not only to whites, but all people. All people. Yahweh says in Exodus 21, you are not to oppress the alien in your land. He says in Exodus 12, you are to have the same law for the stranger as for the native born. So his law would protect all people. <clears throat> all right, continuing. Whites were the first slaves in America. The enslavement of whites extended throughout the American colonies, and white slave labor was a crucial factor in the economic development of the colonies. Gradually, it developed into a fixed system every bit as rigid and codified as Negro slavery was to become. In fact, Negro slavery was efficiently established in colonial America because black slaves were governed, organized, and controlled by the structures and organizations that were first used to enslave and control whites. Black slaves were, quote, late corners fitted into a system already developed by Ulrich B. Phillips' Life and Labor in the Old South, pages 25 and 26. White slavery was the historic base upon which Negro slavery was constructed. The important structures, labor ideologies, and social relations necessary for slavery already had been established within indentured servitude. White servitude, in many ways, came remarkably close to the ideal type of chattel slavery, which later became associated with the African experience. That's Hillary McD Beckles. White Servitude, page 6 and 7 and 71. The practice developed and tolerated in the kidnapping of whites laid the foundation for the kidnapping of Negroes. From Eric Williams, from Columbus to Castro, page 103. The official papers of the white slave trade refer to adult white slaves as, in quotes, freight. And white child slaves were termed half freight. Like any other commodity on these shipping inventories, white human beings were seen strictly in terms of market economics by merchants. The American colonies prospered through the use of white slaves, which Virginia planter John Pory declared in 1619 were our principal wealth. The white servant, a semi-slave, was more important in the 17th century than even the Negro slave in respect to both numbers and economic significance. That's Marcus W. Jernigan, 
laboring and dependent classes in colonial America, page 45. Where mainstream history books or films touch on white slavery, <laughs> it is referred to with the deceptively mild-sounding title of indentured servitude, which we've all heard if we've taken a history class in public school, and you know it and I know it. The implication being that the enslavement of whites was not as terrible or all-encompassing as Negro slavery but constituted instead a more benign bondage, that of servitude. And yet the terms servant and slave were often used interchangeably to refer to people whose status was clearly that of permanent lifetime enslavement. An account of the English sugar plantacons in the British Museum. Oh, I'm sorry, he put a sick there. It was... Uh, taken directly and it was uh, it was misspelled. I'm sorry, it was English sugar plantations, but misspelled. In the British Museum, uh, from the Stowe Manuscript, written circa 1660 through 1685, refers to black and white slaves as servants. Uh, the colonies were plentifully supplied with Negro and Christian servants, which are the nerves and sinews of a plantation. <laughs> They have Planticon again. I don't know. <laughs> this was, uh, Christian was a euphemism for white, uh, in parentheses. In the North American colonies in the 17th and 18th centuries, as subsequently in the United States, servant was the usual designation for a slave. That's from the compact edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, page 2739. Now, I am going to take a moment before I continue. I'm going to address uh, this in parentheses because I have seen this quoted plenty from the literature of the 16, 17, 1800s when referring to a common white European man, Anglo Saxon, Germanic European man, as Christian. And you've noticed that too. And he says here Christian was euphemism for white. Well, first off, we know that pretty much all the Negro slaves brought here were not Christians. Um, some uh, became Christians, converted to Christianity. That's true. But I want to show you something. And many of you might know where I'm going, and if you do, that's wonderful. It's in Hosea chapter 1, after he has his third child. Okay, Yahweh says to him in Hosea 1 9, he said, Call his name Loami. For you, he's speaking of Israel, the northern house of Israel, the ten tribes, for you are not my people, and I will not be yours. Yet the number of the children of Israel will be as the sand of the sea, which can't be measured or counted. And it will come to pass that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. Now, clicking on verse 1, 10, we will probably get from our TSK cross-references, I would say, we'll probably get a reference to John. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become God's children, to those who believe in his name. And many of the translations say, sons of God. Paul, in fact, says, sons of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Um, and he repeats in Romans 9.26, Hosea 1.10. And again and again, Paul repeats that you were made sons of God. Um, beloved, now we are children of God and is not revealed what we will be. John calls all of those who are in Christ, they were sons of God. 
Christians. These common poor whites of Europe were just called Christian, the sons of God. And it not by themselves. This is by this is by other people. This is by this is by authors, writers, different nationalities. Probably by their owners. The use of the word servant to describe a slave would have been very prevalent among a Bible literate people like colonial Americans. In all English translations of the Bible available at the time, from Wycliffe's to the 1611 King James Version, uh, the word slave, as it appeared in the original biblical languages, was translated as servant. For example, the King James Version of Genesis 9.25 is rendered, Cursed be Canaan, Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be. The intended meaning here is clearly that of slave, and there is little doubt that in the mind of early Americans the word servant was synonymous with slave, from Genesis 9.25 in the New International Version Bible. In original documents of the white merchants who transported Negroes from Africa, the blacks were called servants. One notes that the company of royal adventurers referred to their cargo as negers, negers, negro servants, servants from Africa, from Handlin, page 205. The documentary record debunks the propaganda that slavery was strictly a racist operation, part of a conspiracy of white supremacy, <laughs> because, for one, uh, whites as well as blacks were enslaved, uh, for two, in the 17th century, slaves of both races were called servants. And number three, the colonial merchants of 17th century America had no qualms about enslaving their own white kindred, Oscar Handlin. Through the first three quarters of the 17th century, the Negroes, even in the South, were not numerous. For the first three quarters of the 17th century, okay? They came into a society in which a large part of the white population was to some degree unfree. The Negroes' lack of freedom was not unusual. These black newcomers, like so many others, were accepted, bought, and held as kinds of servants. It was in this sense that Negro servants were sometimes called slaves. For that matter, it also applied to white Englishmen. In New England and New York, too, there had early been an intense desire for cheap, unfree hands for bond slavery, uh, villainage, or captivity, whether it be white, Negro, or Indian, from Handlin, pages 202, 203, 204, 218. The early laws against runaways, against drunkenness, against carrying arms, or trading without permission had applied penalties as heavy as death to all servants, Negroes and whites. Handlin, page 214. Oh, and I do want to point out something. That, of course, there were laws at that time against common people arming themselves. Why do you think that is? A survey of the various ad hoc codes and regulations devised in the 17th century for the governing of those in bondage reveals no special category for black slaves. From Henning, Volume 1, pages 226, 258, and 540. During Lagone's time in Barbados, 1647 through 1650, white indentured female servants worked in the field gangs alongside the small but rapidly growing number of enslaved black women. In this formative stage of the sugar revolution, planters did not attempt to formulate a division of labor along racial lines. White indentured servants were not perceived by their masters as worthy of special treatment in the labor regimen. Beckles Natural Rebels, page 29. That was regime, not regiment, sorry. 
labor regime. <clears throat> Whiteness and independence were not firmly connected, nor was blackness yet fully linked with servitude. From Rodiger, page 27. The contemporary academic consensus on slavery in America represents history by re retroactive fiat, decreeing that conclusions about the entire epoch fit the characterizations of its final stage, the 19th century southern plantation system. 17th century colonial slavery and 19th century American slavery are not as seamless as a seamless garment. Historians who pretend otherwise have to maintain several fallacies, the chief among these being the su supposition that when white servants constituted the majority of servile laborers in the colonial period, they worked in privileged or even luxurious conditions which were forbidden to blacks. In truth, white slaves were often restricted to doing the dirty back-breaking field work while blacks and even Indians were taken into the plantation mansion houses to work as domestics. Contemporaries were aware that the popular stereotyping of white female indentured servants as whores, sluts, and debauched wenches and discourage their use in elite planter households. Many pioneer planters preferred to employ Amer Indian women in their households. With the establishment of an elitist social culture, there was a tendency to reject white indentured servants as domestics. Black women represented a more attractive option, and as a result were widely employed as domestics in the second half of the 17th century. In 1675, for example, John Blake, who had recently arrived on the island of Barbados, informed his brother in Ireland that his white indentured servant was a slut, and he would like to be rid of her, in favor of a negger wench. That's from Beckles, Natural Rebels, page 56 and 57. Oh, and incidentally, you know, for all of you uh, out there who, um, you know, just assume that the um, the wealthy uh, white slave owners uh, took advantage uh, of their their black slaves, uh, then just consider uh, how prolific um, not only Cherokee slave owners of blacks and whites, but black slave owners of blacks and whites were and then consider the fact that the same was done to the white female slaves by them. I mean, in the least, can you at least admit that people are just plain wicked? Not just your color, not just my color, not just their color, people. Before you continue crying and belly aching about something you never experienced. In the 17th century, white slaves were cheaper to acquire than Negroes and therefore were often mistreated to a greater extent. Having paid a bigger price for the Negro, the planters treated the black better than they did their Christian white servant. Even the Negroes recognized this and did not hesitate to show their contempt for those white men who they could see were worse off than themselves. Breidenbaugh, page 118. It was white slaves who built America from its very beginnings and made up the overwhelming majority of slave, slave laborers in the colonies in the 17th century. Negro slaves seldom had to do the kind of virtually lethal work the white slaves of America did in the formative years of settlement. The frontier demands for heavy manual labor such as felling trees, soil clearance, and general infrastructure development had been satisfied primarily by white indentured servants between 1627 and 1643 from Beckles 
Natural Rebels, page 8. The merchant class of early America was an equal opportunity in slaver, and viewed with enthusiasm the bondage of all poor people within their grasp, including their own white kinsmen. There was a precedent for this in the English legal concept of villainage, a form of medieval white slavery in England. <clears throat> I think it's actually villainage or villainage. That would be maybe making that a little too French. <laughs> villainage. <laughs> All right. As late as 1669, those who thought of large-scale agriculture assumed it would be manned not by Negroes, but by servile whites, under a condition of villainage. John Locke's constitutions for South Carolina envisioned a hereditary group of servile leetmen, and Lord Shaftbury's signory, <laughs> signory on Locke Island in 1674 actually attempted to put the scheme into practice. From Hanlon, page 207. The Random House Dictionary of the English Language defines servitude as, quote, slavery or bondage of any kind. The dictionary defines uh, bondage as being bound or subjected to external control. It defines slavery as ownership of a person or persons by another or others. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it you know what though it ought to be a thesaurus then because those are uh, those are syn synonyms. Anyways, hundreds of thousands of whites in colonial America were owned outright by their masters and died in slavery. They had no control over their own lives and were auctioned on the block and examined like livestock, exactly like black slaves, with the exception that these whites were enslaved by their own race. White slaves found themselves powerless as individuals without horror or respect and driven into commodity production not by an inner sense of moral duty but by the outer stimulus of the whip. Beckles, White Servitude, page 5. Upon arrival in America, white slaves were put up for sale by the ship captains or merchants. Families were often separated under these circumstances when wives and offspring were auctioned off to the highest bidder. Eleanor Bradbury, sold with her three sons to a Maryland owner, was separated from her husband, <coughs> who was bought by a man in Pennsylvania, from Van Der Zee, page 165. White people, who were passed over for purchase at the point of entry, were taken into the back country by soul drivers, who herded them along like cattle to a Smithfield market, and then put them up for auction at public fairs. Quote, prospective buyers felt their muscles, checked their teeth, like cattle. From Sharon Salinger, to serve well and faithfully, labor and indentured servants in Pennsylvania, 1682 through 1800, page 97. Indentured servants were sold at auction, sometimes after being stripped naked. From Rodiger, page 30. We were exposed to sale in public fairs as so many brute beasts. From Eckrick, page 129. So from now on, all you listening, white, black, brown, yellow, otherwise, when you think of the American slave trade and those people up on that block being stripped and felt up and checked for their health, you can stick whites in there just as much as the blacks. Just as much. More. Contemporary accounts liken them to livestock. Yeah, livestock auctions. They are bought in here. A person noted and sold in the same manner as horses or cows in our market or fair. William Green recalled, They search us there as the dealers in horses do those animals in this country by looking at our teeth, viewing our limbs. William Green, Sufferings of William Green, page 6, and Eckrich, page 123. They're frequently hurried in droves under the custody of severe, brutal drivers into the back country to be disposed of as servants. Jernigan, page 225. 
And you know, from my own commentary, when you think about it, what would many wealthy businessmen of America prefer? Those who already spoke their language or people that they had to somehow teach another language? People who knew another language and could use it to, you know, plot Just saying, I think if I were in their shoes, I would probably prefer somebody who only knew my language, if they were available. Those whites for whom no buyer could be found even after marketing them inland were returned to the slave trader to be sold for a pittance. These whites were officially referred to as refuse and lumps, unloading large numbers wholesale, calling called lumping was a generally a last resort that yielded smaller rewards. White slaver James Cheston wrote to his parents, the servants go off slower than I expected. I shall try them a few days longer in the retail way and then lump the remainder. Large-scale purchases generally reta uh, <laughs> retailed servants farther inland. Uh, they drive them through the country like a parcel of sheep until they can sell them to advantage, wrote white slave John Harrower. <clears throat> the Virginia Company arranged with the City of London to have 100 poor white children out of the swarms that swarm in the place sent to Virginia in 1619 for sale to the wealthy planters of the colony to be used as slave labor. The Privy Council of London authorized the Virginia Company to imprison, punish, and dispose of any of those children upon any disorder by them committed, as cause shall require. The trade in white slaves was a natural one for English merchants who imported sugar and tobacco from the colonies. Whites kidnapped in Britain could be exchanged directly for this produce. The trade in white slaves was basically a return haul operation. The operations of Captain Henry Brain were typical. In November of 1670, Captain Brain was ordered to sail from Carolina with a consignment of timber for sale in the West Indies. From there, he was to set sail for London with a load of sugar purchased with the profits from the sale of the timber. In England, he was to sell the sugar and fill his ship with from 200 to 300 white slaves to be sold in Carolina. The notion of a contract and of the legal status of the white and servitude became a fiction as a result of the exigencies of the occasion. In 1623, George Sandys, the treasurer of Virginia, was forced to sell the only remaining 11 white slaves in his company for lack of provisions to support them. Seven of these white people were sold for 150 pounds of tobacco. The slave status of whites held in colonial bondage can also be seen by studying the disposition of the estates of the wealthy whites. Whites in bondage were rated as inventories and disposed of by will and by deed along with the rest of the property. They were bought, sold, bartered, gambled away, mortgaged, weighed on scales like farm animals and taxed as property. Richard Ligon, a contemporary eyewitness to white slavery, in his 1657 A True and Exact History, tells of a white slave, a woman, who was being traded by her master for a pig. Both the pig and the white woman were weighed on a scale. The price was set for a groat a pound for the hog's flesh and sixpence for the woman's flesh. Page 59. In general, whites were not treated with the relative dignity the term indentured servants connotes, but as degraded chattel, part of the personal estate of the master and on a par with his farm animals. The term indentured servitude, therefore, is nothing more than a propagandistic softening of the historic experience of enslaved white people in order to make a false distinction between their sufferings and those of Negro slaves. <laughs>
This is not to deny the existence of a fortunate class of whites who could in fact be called indentured servants. According to the modern conception of the term, who worked under privileged conditions of limited bondage for a specific period of time, primarily as apprentices. These lucky few were given religious instruction and could sue in a court of law. They were employed in return for their transportation to America and room and board during their period of service. But certain historians pretend that this apprentice system, the privileged form of bound labor, was representative of the entire experience of white bondage in America. In actuality, the indentured apprentice system represented the condition of only a tiny segment of the whites in bondage in early America. Strictly speaking, the term indentured servants should apply only to those persons who had bound themselves voluntarily to service, but it is generally used for all cases of bond servants. From Oliver P. Chitwood, A History of Colonial America, page 341. Richard B. Morris, in Government and Labor in Early America, notes that... In the colonies, however, apprenticeship was merely a highly specialized and favored form of bound labor. Uh, the more comprehensive colonial institution included all persons bound to labor for periods of years as determined either by agreement or by law, both minors and adults, and Indians and Negroes as well as whites. Page 310. <clears throat> in a reversal of our contemporary ideas about white indenture and black slavery, many blacks in colonial America were often temporary bondsmen freed after a period of time. Peter Hancock arranged for a Negro servant named Asha to serve for 12 months, hence forced to be a free person. Bridenboro, page 121-21. Black indentured servants in the 18th century even had an education clause in their contracts. Free Negro boys bound out as apprentices were sometimes given the benefit of an educational clause in the indenture. Two such cases occur in the Princess Anne County records, one in 1719, to learn the trade of Tanner, the master to teach him to read, and the other in 1727 to learn the trade of Gunsmith, the master to teach him to read the Bible, distinctly, from Jernigan, page 162. Newspaper and court records in South Carolina cite, quote, a free Negro fellow named Johnny Holmes, lately an indentured, <coughs> indented servant with Nicholas Trott, and a Negro man commonly called Jack Cutler. He is a free Negro, having faithfully served out his time with me four years, according to the contract agreed upon from Warren B. Smith, page 106. David W. Gallinson is the author of an Orwellian suppression of the horrors and conditions of white slavery, entitled White Servitude in Colonial America. He states concerning white slaves, quote, European men and women could exercise choice both in deciding whether to migrate to the colonies and in choosing possible destinations. This is positively misleading. At the bare minimum, hundreds of thousands of white slaves were kidnapped off the streets and roads of Great Britain in the course of more than 150 years and sold to captains of slave ships in London known as White Guineamen. 10,000 whites were kidnapped from England in the year 1670 alone. Edward Channing, History of the United States, Volume 2, pages 369. The very word kidnapper was first coined in Britain in the 1600s to describe those who captured and sold white children into slavery. Kidnappers. Another whitewash is the heralded, quote, classic work, unquote, on the subject. Abbott. Emerson Smith's 
colonists in bondage, which is one long cover-up of the extent of the kidnapping. The denial of the existence of white slavery and numerous other apologies for the establishment, including a cover-up of the deportation and enslavement of the Irish people. But the record proves otherwise. For more on Abbott Emerson Smith's errors, C.F. Warren B. Smith, White Servitude in Colonial South Carolina, page 9. So next time we'll pick up at Irish slaves. I hope the reading of this book so far has been enlightening. Because it has been for me. I want to point something out because I'm not sure if Hoffman will be pointing this out or not. If you look into today's current white slave trade and if you look into today's um, current numbers of children abducted and missing persons in America alone it is whites always always whites in mass numbers so you can put that into your either self-hating or self-pitying pipe and smoke it. Until next time, I would advise you, love the truth, read the Bible, have faith in Christ alone, and think on these things.